Well, welcome everybody to LifePoint. My name is uh, Andy, and I'm pastor here of LifePoint. And um, I have to start off my sermon in a very particular way, because I promised God I would. Um, we are unapologetically authentic here. You've heard that word a few times, and if you don't know the story, um, when I was creating the vision for LifePoint to be an authentic community of people striving to become more like Jesus, our consultant said, you need to take the word authentic out of there. And I said, well, then I don't want to be a church. And he said, okay, now you can add it back in. He said, there's so many churches that claim that authenticity that uh, just because it's some sort of nice word that people like, but, um, but we're unapologetically authentic. And so that doesn't mean we're just all Debbie Downers. That means that God is good and gets, <laughs> not that Debbie, but... <laughs> But while, while like 40 or 50 ladies were at my house for tea, I was over at my parents' house yesterday, and um, this last week I started a new medication for my uh, depression and anxiety that did not go well, almost landed me in the hospital. And it's been this battle for the last couple of months trying to figure out um, what medication is going to work for me. This morning I woke up, I couldn't feel my hands or my face. Depression just does weird things to you, but uh, I couldn't do it. Last, yesterday I was out. My dad was so gracious. He wrote a sermon yesterday, and I said, I don't know if I can preach tomorrow or not. Um, so he, has a, he had a backup sermon, which was really nice. But I remember last night I was in the shower, and that, that's where I'll often do some of my praying. And uh, I told God, I said, God, will you allow me to preach tomorrow, and will you allow me to have fun bowling tomorrow? And I said, if you do that, you, I'll make sure I give you the praise. And so... God, this is for you. Um, as long as I have breath, I will uh, claim that he is good and that he is faithful, and I hope that we can all do that, no matter what's going on in our life, especially as we go through our series in James, part three. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to James chapter two. Um, and as Preston mentioned, if you need a Bible there, Bibles in the rows there, uh, those are our gift to you. There's nothing more important than the word of God. It's what guides us. It's what gives us meaning and life and hope. And so make sure you have one of those if you don't take it. Um, if you're new to the scriptures in that Bible on page 1012 is where you'll find us this morning. <clears throat> so we're in the middle of our series, James Hears and Doers. Uh, and we're going to be spending the next several weeks in this very practical book. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time or maybe unfamiliar with the letter written by James, a little brief history, history is that James was the brother of Jesus. Growing up, though, James actually thought his brother was kind of crazy. Um, he, he, in fact, it says that in John 7, 5, he said, for not even his brothers, so not even just James, but all of the brothers of Jesus were like, this guy's kind of nuts. None of them believed what he was saying. But then graciously, James' brother Jesus appeared to him after the resurrection. And you can imagine if one of your family members had been talking about someday they were going to be the hope of the world and that they were going to die the death for their penalty, their sins, and rise three days later. You might be thinking they're crazy too until three days later they appear at your doorstep. And you might have a change of heart, right? That's what happened with James. And so this letter that he wrote, he wrote it to the Christians of the time. And he was encouraging them to not just be hearers, but doers. In fact, you would probably do the same thing, right? Three days later, your relative shows up at your door. You might be like, I'm all in. I'm going to follow this man. I'm going to give my life to that. And that's exactly what James does. And his letter oozes exhortations. It communicates a clear message of godly living. And all of what James writes is there to encourage us. In fact, that is the theme. Our theme for this is to help us find the joy that comes from living faithfully as followers of Jesus. That is the hope that we find in this series. Whether you're like me wrestling with depression, or whether you're doing great and you don't need to rely on God. Our hope is that we can all find the middle and we can all rely on God and find the joy that comes from living faithfully as followers of him, not for the world, not for ourselves. And so today's passage 
It's actually certainly one that's going to encourage us to live faithfully. It's actually the big idea for this morning's passage. And while very practical, it's actually a very difficult passage for some of us. You've probably heard the verse, faith without works is what? Dead. Well, what does it mean to have a faith that is working? In addition, how do we balance that with Paul's idea who says it's by grace you're saved, not by works? How do we balance that? So before we read our passage, I would actually like to look briefly at four options as to what's going on here. Three that are inaccurate and one that works with both Paul and James and the rest of scripture. So option one is what's happening here is that works, you'll see it up here on the screen, produces salvation. That's option number one. In other words, if we do enough good works, those good deeds will produce salvation by earning God's favor. And while no Christians believe this, it's actually one of the most common beliefs by people without any real faith at all. If you ask somebody, if you were to die today, would you know that you would go to heaven? And if so, what would you say to God? They'd say, well, I've done more good than I've done bad, right? I've, I've done all these great things, therefore, I will, that will produce for me a salvation in heaven. But this does not fit with Paul's explanation that we are saved by grace, not by works. And this should be very, very freeing to us this morning. It should leap us into praise because it's so encouraging to know that God's love is not dependent upon your works. That there's nothing that you can do that's going to make God love you any more. And there's nothing that you can do that is going to make God love you any less. So we debunked number one. Option number two is that faith plus works produces salvation. This view says that if we believe and perform works, then we can obtain salvation. And this is actually what many Catholics believe, that you, you have to have faith, but then you have to also do all these different things along the way. And if you have that faith and if you do these things, then you, that will produce for you salvation. But this view is one that goes against Paul's teaching and the rest of scripture. So option number three is this. Faith produces salvation. And that's good. Option three says that faith is the result of salvation. And there is some truth in this. But evangelical Christians who support this view often do so because they believe that it's possible to confess faith in Christ while at the same time do whatever they want. They can deem their actions appropriate. And this goes against the teaching of James and the rest of Scripture. So this leads us to our final option, which is what we hold here at LifePoint, and that is this. Faith produces salvation plus works. Faith produces salvation plus works. Another way to put this is that faith leads to salvation and works will then naturally flow out of us. Works are the necessary result of a Christian life. And both Paul and James actually stress this idea of doing good. We see this idea over and over as well in the Bible. Like the gospels say that you will know a disciple by its fruit, by what they do. In 1 Corinthians we read that God will test what sort of work each one has done. So there's works involved. In Ephesians, we read that God's workmanship created in Christ to do good works. We could spend all morning looking at examples that support option four, but instead, I would like for us to look at what this means in more depth. What does it mean to have a faith that works? What is James talking about. So if you have your Bible, James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, and it says this. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, 
without giving them the things that they need for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works and faith was complete by his works and the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteous and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone and in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. This is your word. And we pray that it would come alive. And it would impact us. That we, Lord Jesus, might be a people who are living for you, who are finding joy in all of life. Lord, joy is a choice. It is not dependent upon our circumstances. Joy is a gift that comes from knowing you, no matter what is going on in our lives. And so, Lord, this morning, would you help us find that joy as we search your heart? And we pray it in your son's name. Amen. Have you ever tried a diet that didn't work? I've tried so. You can probably... If so, I can sympathize with you. I recently read an article, though, about dieting, and it gave sort of a comical history, not to make light of some of these things, but it gave a comical history of the different diets that are actually out there, and here's, here's some of the fun that I took away from it. If you've ever tried a diet that didn't work, you also might be able to relate with a man named William the Conqueror. He was a man who lived almost a 1,000 years ago, and apparently old William got so fat that he had trouble staying on his horse. So his diet, his solution, the French king decided enough was enough, so he confined himself to his room and consumed nothing but alcohol. Now, that sounds like an addiction, not a diet, but nevertheless, um, the horse must have found some relief. So the alcohol diet, it didn't work. It won't ever work, but it would probably be plenty popular if it did. Well, we're more accustomed to hearing about things like uh, the Atkins diet or the South Beef Beach diet or maybe the Sonoma diet. Certainly, they're more modern than yesterday's, some of these old ones of the Scarsdale diet or the, the cabbage soup diet, the astronaut diet, the F plan and the zone. Even Oprah Winfrey threw away the Optifast diet that once helped her lose 67 pounds, which she later came out as an advocate for just eating healthy portion control and exercise. But how about this other diet that didn't work? When he was having trouble squeezing into his jumpsuit, Elvis took on the Sleeping Beauty diet. The plan, he would stay heavily sedated for days, hoping to wake up a thinner king. And if he hadn't been for all those peanut butter and uh, banana fried sandwiches, he probably would have been a little bit lighter. Other weight loss plans that haven't worked, the, the vision dieter glasses were supposed to make food look less appealing. The mini fork system was designed to help uh, people take smaller bites. One group uh, applied yoga practices to remove the need for eating altogether. And maybe the most embarrassing moment of American weight loss history was in 1903 when President William Howard Taft, at 355 pounds, the heaviest president in our history, got stuck in the White House bathtub. He vowed to reduce after that, and the America's love-hate relationship with dying, dieting has been going strong ever since. A diet is one thing, having faith with Almighty God is another thing. While a healthy physical life 
is important, something we should strive after, a healthy spiritual life, the abundant life that Jesus offers us is obviously far more important. And we cannot afford to have laughable fads on our bookshelf that last no longer than some of our dieting efforts. But thankfully there's help. There's a real plan for spiritual health, for a faith that works, and you can find it in the Bible. There's no quick fix. There's no fad that's going to take you to some level of mature, to be a mature Christian, but there is a plan that will work as long as you put it in the action and you're faithful with it. And that simple plan is that faith produces salvation plus works. So what does that practically look like, though? What does that look like? What can we expect from that kind of faith? There's probably dozens of answers, but this morning we're just going to look at four from the book of James. First one is this. A faith that works is a faith that works. A faith that works is a faith that works. If you look at James 2.18, it says, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. I will show you my faith by what I do. James isn't the only writer in the New Testament who championed this idea of a faith that works hard. For all of his teachings on grace and the foundational theology of salvation by faith alone, Paul was also committed to this same idea as James. It says in Ephesians 2, 8, through 10, interesting, we always seem to stop at verse 9, but let's read through verse 10. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works. So don't hear me wrong, there's nothing you can do to earn God's love and favor. For we are his workmanship created in Christ for good works, which prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Just as clearly as Paul is saying, we are not saved by grace, he immediately adds on that we are created in Christ to do good works. Work that God had long ago planned for us, long, long ago. And this idea is demonstrated all throughout the Bible. Look at the, the way Jesus made disciples. He first invited people to be his students. But if you notice, it was only those who actually responded that became his disciples. Peter and Andrew knew the, that experience, but the rich young ruler and others who walked away did not. Nicodemus slowly came to follow, but most of the other religious experts did not. Consider also the miracles of Jesus. In many, perhaps most of the miracle stories, Jesus asked key faith questions before the miracle. Or as in the case of the woman who touched the fringe of his prayer shawl, there was an action step that came first, a step of faith that led to the desired result. The people who were healed not only had faith, they had faith that took them where Jesus was and obeyed what he said to do. They had a faith that worked. Over 15 years ago, I was in Canada for the first time. It was my first experience there. And Toby and I, prior to that, had been dating for a while. And one of the things that we liked to do was we liked to look at stars. At night, we used to watch the sunset, and then we would see who could spot the first star the fastest. So one night while I was in Canada, while I was there with her family, we did just that. Toby and I, we watched God paint the sky, and we waited for the first star to appear. And so taking advice from the nursery rhyme, twinkle, twinkle, little star, like a diamond in the sky, I put my hand out and said, there is the first star. When she looked over and my pointing hand was the ring. Did I know she would say yes? I hope so. I was pretty sure. But what did it take? It took some faith. But what did it also take? It also took action. And this idea should get us really excited. God has asked us to partner with him. To act with him. He, he could have left us out. 
He could have chosen to be the only worker and to get all the fame and all the glory for himself, which he, sh- he deserves and we should point to him for. But he chose you to be his voice, his hands, his feet, to be his workmanship. When I was a kid, my parents would always say this, this sentence. We would do something like, you know, do I have to unload the dishwasher? And they'd say, no, you get to unload the dishwasher. Maybe you have that in your house. Do we have to work? No, we get to work. Because God has chosen us to be his partners, to be his workers. Second, so faith that works is a faith that works. Second is a faith that works will be tested. We talked about this two weeks ago in detail, and James doesn't waste any time getting around to this point. Right after the bat, he says, Dear church, greeting barely behind him, he starts and teaches a lesson number one involving the testing of our faith. He's right after he says, dear church, he says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let that steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. I'll be honest. I've never felt more testing than I have right now. And to be honest, it's not, just our whole, it's not just me either. It's our whole staff. Since Preston and Alicia have joined the staff, they've lost a baby, a grandfather, and a dad. And that's been like eight months, something like that. Harrison's gone through a lot of ups and downs. He just had some really bad car trouble that cost him thousands of dollars. Despite eating well and exercising and seeing my doctors and counselors, my health, my depression, anxiety, they've been bad. We were joking with Dan the other day. And we said, watch out, you're the only one. And that day, his car broke down. (laughs) You know, I really feel like we are being tested as a church, and it makes sense. There's someone who does not want this church to happen. And in James, he takes away any pretension that it would be anything except that way. From the earliest days of the church, persecution and trials have been part of God's education package given to those who follow him. A faith that is tested has the opportunity to grow stronger to a place where it works. And so all I do is I take what's happening and I go, God's doing something here at LifePoint. So James says, when you see trouble coming, rejoice. You're about to tap into a faith that works. And I know it's not just us. I know many of you are going through difficult times too. But it's encouraging to know that you are not alone. We're in this together. One of my favorite pastors, authors, Craig Groeschel, just put out a new book titled Hope in the Dark. It just came out. I tried to order it and it's already sold out. You see, it's not me. It's not you. Trials are everywhere. Maybe it's a kid who's gone wayward, a marriage that's rocky, a job that's come to an end, financial strains, a loss of a loved one, criticism from a friend or a family member, unexpected diagnosis. And James says, take heart. When you see trouble coming, rejoice. You have the opportunity to tap into a faith that is works, a faith that is working. So a faith that works is a faith that works. A faith that works will be tested Thirdly, a faith that works will be patient. We're going to skip ahead a few chapters to chapter 5, verse 7 through 9. It says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit on the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts. Root your hearts. For the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. I read this from his book, but Chuck Yeager, who is the pilot who first broke the time barrier, revealed something really interesting, some tidbits about aviation history in his autobiography. One of the most unusual things that happened was Edwards Air Force Base in the late 50s, there was a test pilot diving a Mach 2 
fighter, and he actually outraced the shells from his cannons and shot himself. You see, without patience, we are likely to do the same thing. We may live in a world of instant gratification, but there is nothing fast about finding a faith that works. It's often slow going. It can be very difficult, a very trying thing. But at the same way that precious metals are slowly refined, purified, reshaped, formed into expensive jewelry and finally polished to a perfect shine, we too can go through the process and be refined, be made more like Jesus, be sanctified. And while that process is happening, however, we must learn to exercise supreme patience. The reality is true faith that works will never be complete here on this earth. Until heaven, we're gonna be continually being refined. But here's the excitement in it all. A faith that works will be worth the effort. A faith that works will be worth the effort. Return to me the opening passage of James. Let's take a good look at the reward of one who is patient, one who will commit to a faith, walk despite the testing, and one who will take specific practical action steps of discovering a faith that works. James says this. He says, count it all joy My brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Notice that the promise that is given is given at the end so that you may be mature, complete, not lacking in other. This is the way that promises work. This is the way that success works. It doesn't matter if you're an NFL player who just won the Super Bowl or someone who has just crowned Miss America, the ultimate prize did not come until the end, after hard work. And sometimes I think it's easy to get discouraged because we want it now, right? We're like our kids, even though we don't say it. So an effort to get the feeling of immediate satisfaction, what do we do? We seek other things that give us temporary joy, that give us temporary pleasure. But having a faith that works is far more valuable than a temporary moment of worldly pleasure, worldly success. Having a faith that works will see you through the worst times in life and give you greater depth and and satisfaction to the best of the times in life. The Greek word for maturity, which means perfect, complete, not lacking in anything, is teleos. And James uses this word five times in his short letter, indicating that the instructions here are something almost of a manual of how to grow as a mature believer. And it may be difficult to get there, just as there may be difficulty to achieving achieving anything worthwhile but the end result is worth every part of the struggle. Even if you never experience the happiness and the life that you wanted here on earth, the end result will be worth the struggle. I'll end with this story. There's a story, it's obviously not real because it's about, about a duck town, but there's a story of a town where all the residents were all ducks. Every Sunday, the ducks waddled out of their houses and waddled down Main Street to church. They waddled into the sanctuary and they squat in their proper pews. The duck choir waddled in and took its place and the duck minister comes in forward and opens the duck Bible. He reads to them, ducks, God has given you wings. With wings you can fly. With wings you can mount up and soar like eagles. No walls can confine you. No fences can hold you. You have wings. God has given you wings and you can fly like birds. 
all the ducks shouted, amen. And then they all waddled home. (laughs) You see, there's no time for waddling. Put your faith into works and do what God is asking you to do because a faith that works is a faith that works. Put it into action. Don't leave here today just hearing and saying amen and feeling good about your safe and waddling home. Because by God's grace, he has saved you. By grace you have been saved that transforms everything about you. You go from being homeless to homed. You have a name. You go from having no purpose to having purpose and meaning in life, from no identity to identity. You go from having no hope to having hope. God's choosing of you, his his completely changes your life, changes who you are. The temptation is going to want to be to leave here the same. But God's calling us to be different, to, be a, to have a faith that works. Let's pray.